welcome to the We Are Human Leaders podcast. What do hostage negotiators and CEOs have in common? Which skills serve you when your life is being threatened, but also when you're relating to your colleagues in an everyday meeting? I'm Sally Clark, and together with my co-host Alexa Sana, today we're talking to someone who has vast experience with both situations, George Colreza. In this conversation, we're talking about grief. We explore how grief, especially unresolved grief, impacts us as humans and as leaders, and how we can start to bring awareness to grief so it becomes a powerful tool for connection and even creativity in the workplace and beyond. George Colreza is a clinical and organizational psychologist, author, speaker, and consultant. He is Professor of Leadership and Organizational Behavior at the International Institute for Management Development Business School based in Lausanne, Switzerland, and the author of the award-winning book, Hostage at the Table, How Leaders Can Overcome Conflict, Influence Others, and Raise Performance, and co-author of Care to Dare, Unleashing Astonishing Performance Through Secure-Based Leadership. George shares his personal experiences of grief, as well as his professional experience as a hostage negotiator. He gives us powerful takeaway tips that we can use today as leaders and as humans to open up this important topic. A content warning for this episode, we discuss issues of mental health, violence, trauma, death and suicide, which may be distressing or triggering for some listeners. Both Alexis and I were left moved and inspired after this conversation. We suspect you will be too. Let's dive in. Welcome to the We Are Human Leaders podcast, George. It is an absolute delight to have you here with us today, joining us all the way from beautiful Switzerland. And we'd love to know a little bit more about you first, George, and your journey. And in particular, what's brought you to the work that you're doing now around the subject of grief? Very good questions. And first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be there. I love Australia. Because of COVID, it's not been so easy to come, but I hope to get there not so far in the future. So what happened is I ended up working in the whole arena of mediation, conflict management, hostage negotiation, and it became clear to me that stress was the guiding force behind the motivation. And the stressor was really lost in all the various forms. So it could be Everything from death to disappointment to frustration, not met expectations, changes in identity. So it became clear to me. And then I sought out a wonderful teacher, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Maybe you're too young to remember her, but she was an inspiration to me and a teacher, a friend, and a colleague before she died. And I realized how important it was to understand grief across a broad range of behavior, but especially around conflict. So working with police, working with patients in psychotherapy, and dealing with mediation, loss was one of the key factors. Wow. And just looking, you know, I heard you mention there, George, this idea of grief. And the first sort of mention you made of that is, I guess, the typical one we associate grief with, and that is like bereavement, the loss of a person. But I heard you mention a few other ways in which we experience grief, the loss of a job, disappointment. I think this is a concept that we so often don't understand really the depth in which grief touches our lives. And can you give us a little bit more, I guess, well-rounded picture of the different ways that we experience grief? Like what, how, what causes us to experience grief? Well, you're absolutely correct. It's not just death. Actually, the biggest amount of grief comes from losses not connected with death, but it's the end of something. It's the end of something, an identity. It's the end of an expectation. It's a merger and acquisition in a company. It's leaving home. It's everything that has to do with how I let go and move forward. And you're right. Grief is very much misunderstood. And it's a normal process. The psychiatric and psychological community has made a serious mistake by associating or being focused on transforming grief into a psychological problem. It's normal. It's natural. It's how we let go. So when I'm asked, what is grief? Grief is the experience, the emotional experience 
of how we let go of something, whatever it might be. And how many times do you see people not let go of something? They get a divorce and don't get over it. They lose a job and don't get over it. They have an expectation and it is not met. They have a failure. I could keep going for long lists, but they suffer, they become a victim to that. Or as we talk about in in the hostage negotiation arena, they become a hostage to what they have lost. So grief work is about how you say goodbye to something and remembering that you don't just one time get over grief. Grief is a lifelong process. And the deepest griefs you revisit by the triggers that remind you of what they have been in your life. So it's not that you want to always be over grief. It's when grief is triggered or something reminds you, you're then able to go through that grief again. And the outcome of knowing when you're over grief is to come to the full joy of work, come to the full joy of life. And how many people are not experiencing the full joy of living or even the full joy of work? That's really a beautiful observation there, George. And I really feel like it's almost if we can accept grief as a natural part of life and not something that is finite, there's almost a sense of a paradox that we can have grief and experience loss, but we can also have joy simultaneously and it's not mutually exclusive. And yet I feel like there is in our culture, and you spoke to this a little in the sort of psychiatry world, psychology world, that there's been this kind of labeling of it as something that is inherently perhaps weak or something that we need to be embarrassed about or almost hide. What are the dangers when we actually do that, when we push down grief and we don't give ourselves space to experience it in work and also more broadly in life? That's a really good question because the article I wrote is about hidden grief and its role in leadership, but its role in human behavior. So when you hide grief and it remains hidden, it's going to come out in depression. How many people are depressed because they didn't get over something? And to go deeper into understanding that, we have to be able to tap into emotions. What are the emotions involved in the grieving process? It's not just crying. It can be anger, even rage. It can be fear, even panic. It can be loss and crying. Those are the primary emotions. And then you have the secondary manifestations. So grief is about the emotional process of being able to go through that. Depression is one signal that you have unresolved grief. Addiction is another. My goodness, the massive amount of addictions, not just to drugs, but any kind of behavior that is a pathological relationship. So Dr. Monty defines grief or addiction as focus on a short-term benefit with long-term consequences. And that qualifies for all kinds of addictions. And then you mentioned, and we mentioned physical illness. How much physical illness is manifestations of unresolved grief? One question from a doctor or a helping profession or a nurse or a caretaker, what is the major stress that's happening to you? What is the loss that you have recently faced can make all the difference in opening up those emotions. So that becomes very important to understand all the different manifestations, and then they come out in all kinds of behaviors. Absolutely. And it sounds like typically some of those behaviors, you know, tend to be then problematic or perhaps manifest in other physiological things that are uncomfortable or that we don't want to experience. And this, I guess, is more of a personal question for me. And I think What I would love to know is I've experienced grief in many different manifestations in my life. I've experienced it, you know, through the loss of loved ones, such as parents and as friends and family members. And my first real big experience with grief as a young adult, when I lost a parent, was to avoid handling it. And, you know, for parents or for all of us learning to handle grief, I think when I reflect now and when I reflect on what you've already said, you know, there are so many moments in my life before that where I learned to handle things that were uncomfortable that I couldn't label at the time as being grief. You know, the disappointment of not getting picked in a football team, the disappointment of not getting picked as a girlfriend, the disappointment of not getting picked or getting my A plus in my English class. 
Yeah. And for me, I realize now that my way of dealing with those things was to hide my disappointment and actually just kind of push through them and say, well, they don't bother me. They don't care anyway. And, you know, I realized then when it came to losing a parent, which was my first significant bout of grief as an adult, that my entire mechanism was to run from it for years, you know, push it down, soldier on, get on with it. But I'd love to know a little bit more because I know in your incredible research and in the McKinsey report information that you published, there were some great case examples of how then that manifested for people in their professional life. And I'm starting to notice now in my professional life, all the ways that when I'm uncomfortable, it sabotages some of my other ability to put myself forward for work and things like that. And I'd love to hear perhaps if you could help us, George, to connect some of those dots around how unresolved grief might actually impact us in things like leadership positions or career even. Sure. That's the organizational aspect. There's the personal aspect. The way it connects, Alexis and Sally, is through the attachment behavior. How do we attach? How do we bond? So the question becomes, when was the first major loss in my life? So if you are adopted, if you go to a boarding school, if there's a disruption in the bond with the mother, the father, the grandparents, then you have to understand that becomes a printing in the brain to already understand the impact of loss. How was it dealt with? Did, were you taken care of? Were you nurtured? Did you create a bond after that? whatever the disruption was. So that later losses then trigger those memories of early trauma. And we know now that it's very significant to understand where the disruption in the attachment system occurred before the age of 12. And that presents the possibility that that is the early trigger. Then in the present situation, how do the emotions show up? The emotions can be rage and anger. The emotions can be sadness and crying. And the point about grief is that you can get over anything, but you have to feel it. You have to feel it. And the brain hates pain. It's that simple. But we have to teach our brain, (laughs) self-leadership, how to engage in pain. It's just like learning a new habit. If you're going to work out, if you're going to establish some kind of change in behavior, you have to go through the pain of making that happen. So once you understand the importance of feeling it to heal it, you engage it. You engage it. Like yourself, you lost a parent, if I understood you correctly. I lost a son, 1993. After our trip to Australia, he was in medical school. We came back and thank God we took that trip. He was in an accident in front of the hospital and he died. Now, even though I knew about grief, I had to go through it. I had to go through the pain and the rage and all the manifestations of that to be able to come back and be inspired. And here's the thing. Grief is a pathway in the journey for future inspiration. What do I remember about my son? What do you remember about your parents? What do you remember about a failure? How do we reconstruct the brain? so that we have learned something from what happened and we can see it as a positive thing. Dr. Edgar, who was in Auschwitz as a teenager, almost, well, you probably know her, uh, Sally, or heard about her, because she was in Holland. She came, I invited her to IMD. And her parents were killed in Auschwitz. She was tortured. She nearly died. Took her 25 years to deal with that grief. And then she wrote a book called The Choice. The essence of that is I have a choice. Every person has a choice to think about what they have lost and to find it what is meaningful. She describes being in Auschwitz as the greatest gift to understand the joy of life. Mamma mia, the greatest gift. It's what she learned. And this follows Viktor Frankl's work. He was a mentor to her. And Viktor Frankl was the whole person who talked about he was very early in the neuroscience. We did, he didn't know all the neuroscience of today, but he didn't know about brain reconstruction and how to reconstruct the memory and go on and use whatever the loss is as an inspiration. That's a challenge. And if you have someone who teaches you that, you are blessed. Thank you so much for sharing, George, your own personal experience and also 
those two names. It's I've recently been uh, going through a, a divorce, and it's interesting that without even consciously making that link, I picked up both the choice and Viktor Frankl's book as well, Man's Search for Meaning. Almost subconsciously, I think, uh, understanding that there is a big grieving process going on, and that being able to frame it in that way was helpful. And I, I want to reflect on something that you mentioned that I think is really important that you you said, you know, even knowing as much as you did about grief at the time of the loss of your son, it's still this actual experience, this emotional experience. I think for many of us in leadership roles, we can very much understand at a very intellectual level what happens and and understand and see see it, but that can sometimes almost create distance and inhibit us from actually having the courage to go through that emotional process. It's almost like we have to let go of the comfort of our intellectual understanding and let the emotions be there. Is that something that you've had experience with and also witnessed in leaders? Yes, very, very much. Massive amounts. It shows up, you use the word distancing. It means they are not able to create a bond or they're emotionally unavailable. So we have so many leaders who believe and have been taught If you're vulnerable, if you have emotions, you're not a good leader. Strong leaders don't show emotion, don't, are not emotionally available, which is pure garbage. We know from emotional intelligence, it's central to being able to connect with the people you are leading. And so what we have to do is help leaders understand what the grief has been in their life. And there are two aspects of that. What have been the recent or recent past losses? And what have been the early losses? Because the foundations of leadership become so important. If you went to a boarding school, for example, and you never dealt with a painful experience, or you went to a boarding school and it was a positive thing and you emancipated very early, both of those can have serious ramifications on your leadership behavior. It's The key is awareness. How am I aware? And in the article, Charles and I talk about three special steps. One, to accept I am grieving. Most people can't even accept it. And then once you accept it, to be able, well, first to, to be aware, I, should, that, uh, I miss, missed it, to be aware and then to accept it, to say, okay, I am grieving, and then to do something about it. No loss is too great to get over. And for leadership, it's massive, whether it's a merger and acquisition, it's a failure, it's a disappointment. They're carrying all kind of pain, but it's not just the present pain, it's the early pain. So I just dealt with somebody for, who's a CEO of a top company, and he's very vulnerable to rejection. He gets really upset because he thinks he's done something wrong. Where did this first start? With his father. His father didn't, never accepted him. He was never good enough. So it becomes hardwired in the brain that he has that grief of the father that gets triggered when people give him feedback in which he's not perfect. So we have to not just understand the immediate past, but also understand the foundations of leadership. And one of the things that I'm most focused on is helping emotional leaders become emotionally available. And that simply means, first of all, to learn how to cry. I can't tell you the number of people who come to my training programs, the high performance leadership, which we run 10 times a year, full almost a year in advance, 60 top leaders at a time, many have never cried or they stopped crying at a certain point in their life to go back and be able to do that again. Or tougher is how to deal with rage. Many people carry rage and they don't even know how to put a word to it. So part of the grief understanding is to be able to label the primary emotions, anger, fear, sadness, and then the secondary manifestations, which can be quite extensive. Wow, I have reflected very deeply personally <laughs> as you were speaking then, George. Yeah, let me just add one more point. You cannot grieve alone. That's mm-hmm. the other thing that you to understand. Grieving is done in a tribe, in a family, in a clan. From the beginning of mankind, it was never meant to be done alone. We need people around us. We need secure bases. And so one of the big problems is people who hold the pain inside and they don't share it with a family, a clan, or a tribe. So there's only a small part that you can do alone in which you come back to some significant part of yourself. And usually that has to do with identity. We 
don't understand as much as we should about the grief of loss of identity. You're a child growing up in a family. You change the identity when you leave home, emancipate. When you get married or form a partnership, when you have kids, when you get a job. I mean, all of these changes in identity require letting go of something, grieving and letting go of something. But we can't do it alone. No. And I think what's so impactful, George, about your last comment, I mean, I have about a thousand thoughts that I'd love to go back and recap on, but just starting with this concept of the tribe, because something that I see a lot happening in organizations is that people don't feel seen and they don't feel heard. And I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, but part of the grief process to me feels like just the capacity to be witnessed by other human beings in our pain and be loved and accepted and held regardless of what we're going through. Is that something that you've experienced people just really? Absolutely. The, in a hostage situation, for example, uh, the hostage negotiator dealing with a very psychotic person, a criminal, a narcissist, whatever the behavior is, hostage negotiator has to create a bond with that person. And they have to listen to the pain points, empathy, compassion. The person wants to be understood. And then you move to the concession making process. And what would you say the success rate of hostage negotiators are as measured by Interpol and uh, the FBI? Rough guess. Zero to Oh, my goodness. Step in the dark. Oh, I would want to say really low, to be honest, because I feel like these are cases that feel like they're very extreme. What, what would you yeah. Say, Sally? Yeah, I would have said quite low as well. I think it's really, yeah. So there's it's so much to 90, unpack with someone. 95% success rate. Oh my wow. God. That's crazy. It is the art and science of influencing. It is the most advanced form of leadership that I can identify. So what happens is they want something, they have a desire, they are built into a negative, destructive process with negative emotions, or I shouldn't say negative emotions, destructive emotions, and then how to be able to see some path out. The 5% where it doesn't work is people want to commit suicide by police, so they do something stupid, and they get themselves shot by the police. And the big sign for that is if they don't want something. You see, the key is what is the desire. And this is a very negative sign for grief as well. If you lose, the desire for anything into the future, then you become a different kind of risk, even to suicide. And I mean, suicide is very highly connected to loss and the despair and not seeing a way to get over a particular loss. I cannot live without something. Yeah, I think that's so profound what you're saying, and I, I, particularly around the idea of, you know, there's such an extreme situation when you're dealing with a hostage negotiation that's obviously high stakes and a lot of us experience you know in our own lives to some extent sort of high stakes interactions with people but what i'm hearing is there's almost in order to have a chance of coming to any kind of healthy conclusion we have to form a bond with the other we have to see the humanity in that person irrespective of the criminal behavior that they're displaying to you in that moment at the same time and you can bond with anybody if you can find a common goal and the secret is turning an ad adversary or an enemy into an ally. But the hostage taking is one thing with a weapon. Now there's psychological hostage taking. So you can be a psychological hostage to a boss, to a situation, to the pandemic. Look at how many people felt like a hostage to the pandemic, to just wearing a mask, getting a vaccination, or in personal life to spouses, to friends, to family members, teachers, and that's not even the worst. The worst is hostage to yourself. What does that mean? You are filled with regret, anger, revenge, shame, humiliation, the thousands of internal states that block you. So in leadership training, and I'm working at a business school where we're focused on helping senior leaders learn how to overcome those barriers to be the best leader they can be. And that means leading yourself. So leading yourself and then leading others and then ultimately leading organizations. But you see how this whole process unfolds if you are a hostage to yourself and you don't have to have a weapon to feel like a hostage. And I've been held hostage four times myself physically, 
in my work in domestic violence. So I know the power of words and I know the power of bonding. It saved my life. I've been involved in over a hundred situations, been involved with directly with being held by a weapon in four and talking. And I'm very happy to be here today. Talking saved my life. That's why I'm convinced of the bonding process. Incredible, George. I think that's and we're so glad you're here too. That's just a really a testament to your skill and your capacity to create that bond. And I think also imagine very much staying. Uh, I'm curious about those moments because I can imagine there is a natural instinct to get caught in fear and you know escalate into a really stressed state. But in order to get through those situations, you really, I imagine, have to stay very present and very grounded. Can you tell us a little bit more? You're absolutely right. So that the brain will actually for survival, produce panic, produce deep fear, produce all kinds of emotion, even rage and anger, but that has to be controlled. And so then you have to be able to use the executive part of the brain to manage that and focus on the goal. So then you let your words be guided by the goal, not by your emotion. Dan Goldman used to call that an amygdala hijack. He now calls it emotional hijack. Many people have that kind of reaction. How do I control the focus? One time when I was held hostage, it was with the scissors, and Sam was putting the scissors to my throat after holding Sheila, a nurse, a hostage. And very shortly after I entered the room at the request of the police lieutenant, he cut her throat, not her juggler, but the side. So she fell to the floor screaming, my kids, my kids, I, my kids, in a panic. She thought she was going to die. Sam comes around the table towards me with that scissors. Now, what would you say if someone is coming to you screaming with full rage, they're going to kill you? Well, he never cut the skin of my throat, but he did put the scissors there. And after a few transactions didn't work, I asked him, Sam, how do you want your kids to remember you? And he said, don't talk about my kids. Bring them in here and I'll kill them too. He did it with a lot more anger. Now, that was a good transaction, huh? Because we start the dialogue. Within 10 minutes, the first request, we let Sheena go. And within 20 minutes, because he had been brought to the hospital because of a stab wound, we had to get him out of that room, and he walked out. But you see, it wasn't the fact that I tell him he has to do that. He made the choice. So you ask questions. You don't use command and control. You always give choice. Having an emotional response. Yeah, agreed. I firstly, just to acknowledge how unfathomable in my life being in an experience like that must feel. So, you know, thank you for sharing that with us because I'm extremely confident every listener we have will not find that experience, you know, in any way relatable to what we deal with in our everyday lives. But I think what's so fascinating, George, is the thread between unresolved grief and how that actually manifests for those of us in our everyday lives, but how that left unchecked, you know, can in these instances still be the driving force for some of these, you know, psychotic behaviors. So thank you for sharing that. And again, this thread between conflict and grief is one that's very fascinating for me. And the idea that this same skill set that you've used in negotiating is one that can be largely translated to how we perhaps manage ourselves and manage employees. And I'm imagining the implications or the usages for that around things like disgruntled employees, uh, team conflicts within organizations. And often we see a lot of conflict arises. It may start as a task conflict in the organization, but then it spills into the affective conflict, into the interpersonal conflict when we feel like we're not being seen and heard. And often many of us aren't aware that some of those wounds are being triggered in those instances. And that's what's causing that very emotional response for us. And I just want to go, you know, and step towards this sort of the context of the organization again. And obviously, grief is something that we all experience. And you've touched on these ideas that, you know, going or experiencing grief in community and in tribe is really, really important. And that vulnerability is something that you implore in leaders. But what do you see in your work as being some of the barriers around why grief isn't being spoken about more in leadership and in organizational contexts? The main reason, Alexis, is fear of emotion, fear of expression emotion. 
Secondly, not even being aware of emotion. So the person just keeps going on and on, or they don't pay attention to what that loss has meant. So they do what is called rebounding. They go from one attachment behavior to another without going through the grief. And you cannot truly say hello till you say goodbye. You cannot truly say hello till you say goodbye. So that all the following attachments then tend to be superficial. So it's not psychologically safe for many people in organizations to show how they feel. Um, and so what we are now really focused on, emotional intelligence was a game changer. Now the game changer is psychological safety. How does a leader create the psychological safety for people to act and behave without feeling they're going to be attacked or downgraded, whatever? And so what has to happen is you have to be able to know what is it you desire. You see, the foundation of all this a grief process is to know what I desire. So if your desire is, I can't live without this person, you see, that's a suicidal statement. You can live without any individual, but it may be very, very painful. It may be in the mindset that you think that, but you have to be able to go through that. And what did I learn from that relationship to get over it? So in organizations, how to build the psychological safety, how to create the process for people to express what they desire. How many people swallow their desires? So they become depressed. They turn to addiction. They get sick. Dr. Mahdi talks about the fact that the body, the person who can't say no, their body will say no. So the sickness is a form of no. The addiction is a form of no. The, the depression. So what is the desire? And then how do I start putting those desires out? How many people don't know what they want? They don't know what they want. Most, yeah, yeah, most they, absolutely. They're very abstract about it, or they want two opposite things at the same time. How to get that clarity? So as a hostage negotiator, it's very clear you have to be able to help the hostage taker understand what they desire. What leaders have to do when they're dealing with a difficult conversation, what does that person want? Do they want to prove they're the smartest at the table? Do they want an apology? Do they want to just fight? What is it they desire? And then you help them turn that desire into something constructive. So we talk about destructive emotions and how to turn destructive emotions, which is in the behavior, into positive emotions. All emotions are ultimately positive, even if it's rage, even if it's deep crying, and how to be able to understand that. Sally, you look like you wanted to ask something. Again, always a thousand questions, George. There's so much richness to what you're sharing with us. But I think particularly, I really, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is this kind of idea of sort of negative and positive emotions. I think these labels really limit us because to my mind, and I'm curious as to your thoughts on this, emotions are trying to tell us something. They're a, it's a form of intelligence in, you know, that we have as humans, and they can be so instructive and they can be so kind often trying to get us to acknowledge things that we don't want to. They can be so wise, I think. And I think there's, we really undermine ourselves when we, and this is of course, you know, I think both socially, but also in an organizational context for so long, there's been no room for emotions and certainly no room for negative emotions. Many of us grow up in households where negative emotions are not welcome, and that's something we carry through our lives then. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more from you about the wisdom of emotions in, you know, for leaders and how we can tap into that wisdom. That's a beautiful expression, the wisdom in our emotions. Behavioral economics, already in 1992, won the Nobel Economics Prize for the two findings, basically. There were many more. But the two basic findings is one is we are fundamentally an emotional being who happens to think. Many leaders think the opposite. They think we think and we happen to have emotions. Behavioral economics proved that not to be true. We are emotional beings that happen to think. And loss is the most powerful emotion in motivation and making decisions. Whether you're the most rational person in the world or the most cognitive person, you still are influenced by the emotions. The emotions are this deep gift that God gave us, or however you believe the origin was, 
in which there are signals to survival. There are signals to survival. And other times there are signals to joy, what brings joy. So the thing is, you can't always trust those emotions because it can be distorted by trauma so that you look for threat and danger where it's not really there. The person who worries all the time, they worry about anything, anywhere, anytime, morning to night. Their brain is working perfectly correct, but they're going to die prematurely from stress, illness, and disease, and they're going to make others miserable while they're waiting to die. The brain has to be rewired in such a way that you're able to see beyond the pain or the loss and see the beauty. What blocks you from seeing the beauty is grief. It's being stuck with the emotion that you are trying to survive. And grief takes us back to that survival level. Why is the brain fundamentally negative? Because the brain has one overriding goal, survival. So we have to look for danger and threat. And loss is a danger and threat. For the baby, it means death without being taken care of. As you grow up, the whole idea of rejection can become a life-threatening kind of thing. So the brain is fundamentally negative, but we have to rewire the brain to see the positive. And we do this through secure bases. Secure base leadership is about having people, goals, homes, objects, things that give us a feeling of protection and inspiration to take risks, seek change, do new things, to experience the adventure of life the beauty of life. How many people have lost that drive? They don't dare themselves because they don't feel safe. We had a senior leader from HR come to one of the programs at IMD. He was filled with anxiety, constantly anxious. And then he discovered that as a child, he was not allowed to play with other kids. He was not allowed to go to the sandbox because his mother thought he would get sick. She didn't want him to be around other children. He never climbed a tree. That became a kind of point of focus. And he was in a coaching group of five other people, and they found a tree. And for the first time (laughs) at 44 years of age, he climbed a tree. He was terrified, but they supported him. They were secure base. He climbed it. Once he did, he loved it. He loved it. They couldn't get him down out of the tree. Then he wanted to keep going back up again. Can you imagine 44 years old before you learned to climb a tree? But you see, he was rewiring his brain through the secure basis to understand how to get over that loss. Yeah. And, you know, interestingly, George, when you say this, you know, you make this comment, can you believe that? Actually, you know, personally, I can through, you know, my own inner child work and feeling supported through moving some of these periods in my life as well. It is fascinating how you can, as an adult, start to appreciate some of the things that you were perhaps I know for some people, it might even be forbidden as a child. I certainly know the household I grew up in, we weren't always safe to make mistakes or mistakes weren't easily tolerated. So for a long time in my young career, I was really fearful of trying things because I was really, really scared of making mistakes because that was punishable in my household. And, you know, that's simply the parents of that generation and how discipline looked for them and how they taught us right from wrong. However, you don't always connect the dots between how you internalize that and then how that presents as an adult. So it's really fascinating that gentleman was able to have that incredible experience. And let me just interrupt there as an example, what would have been the best response from your parents? I think probably to let me know that the outcome I'd achieved wasn't what I was looking for, but how to do it better next time. However, I think there's a fine line between punishment and discipline. Yeah. So keep the bond, stay connected. That becomes traumatic for the child to make a mistake threatens the relationship. And here's a very important point. How many people are in a state of grief or anticipate a grief, which is even worse than actual grief? because they will sacrifice their own desires for the sake of a relationship. They will sacrifice their own desires for the sake of a relationship. Everyone who's a people pleaser. (laughs) So this is how you can connect things back to the early traumas that are internal. If you ask somebody, they would not say, well, that's not such a big trauma, but it was internally a trauma because it was the threat. How did our caretakers, our early caretakers, respond to our desires. 
most of the time they are failing in that they punish, they withdraw, they disconnect, they do all kinds of things that teaches the lesson, don't make a mistake or don't show what you really want. Yeah, you're so right. And one other reflection I picked up on, George, that I just wanted to reiterate was this idea that emotions are actually safe to experience. And I heard you say that often the bulk of our stress or discomfort and perhaps even mental illness comes when we try and push whatever we're experiencing away and we can't accept or experience that. And so it stays trapped and it then manifests into that stress that we're experiencing. So it's the desire to be in a different state and not accepting the state we're in is actually the cause of that stress. Exactly. Nice people do die early. (laughs) Yeah. Why? Because they don't express their desires. You read obituaries and you can often see the the story because it's not just mental illness manifestation, Alexis, it's physical illness. The disease, the amount of disease and illnesses, when somebody is sick or they have an illness, they have to ask, what has been lost in my attachment system? What has happened to the desires that I didn't express? And the whole idea of being authentic means I am in touch with my inner desires, and then I express those. Now, relationship is being able to control your desires and be able to take into account another person's desires. So we negotiate, we interact in a way. And this is the heart of leadership. So on a team, the leader has to be able to do that. Know what the individuals that are following that person want. What do they desire? How do we take those into account? How do we engage people in desires that are destructive or desires that don't fit the team goals? All of this becomes fodder for how to be able to deal with grief. I think that's a powerful insight, George, because it helps us sort of understand that, you know, I think there's often leadership, we can be very forward focused, but it's so important to actually look at a personal level as well, back to understand how the past is also informing our present and our future decision making. Yeah. And the doorway to understand that is triggers. What triggers people off and be able to track back the early trigger and understand where that early trauma was internally. The problem is we often think trauma is only external, but the real key is what is the internal reaction. Amazing. Yeah, I think that being aware of our triggers and honestly, even during this conversation, I've become aware of a number more of mine that I had and also piecing together some of my past as well. So I'm just so grateful for uh, being here with you, George. Thank you. One word we slipped over pretty fast there was anticipatory grief. So anticipatory grief is before the actual grief occurs. In a way, anticipatory grief is even worse than the real grief because the real grief, it's over, it's done, it's finished. You have to let go. But anticipatory grief is living over and over again that you might lose that or that you will lose that. So you anticipate the loss and you have the same emotions as the real loss, but it doesn't end till it actually ends. Mm, And, you know, to reflect on a personal experience there, George, I think it's interesting because you hear people who are going through, you know, typically the loss of a loved one, they'll say, you know, there's the moment you find out someone's ill or someone's dying, and that's grief in of itself. And I've experienced this with the loss of my parent, my father, and then you have the months or weeks of grieving the loss in advance. And then I always heard people try and explain to me before I went through the actual loss that the grieving process will start again when he really dies. And oh my goodness, doesn't it ever. And you know, it's grief in so many different forms. And you know, it is unavoidable. But I understand how in some circumstances, that anticipatory grief is almost like paying tax twice. Because in some circumstances, we actually will have the choice to reframe that, you know, whether it's It's the loss of a job that you might fear could come in the future, you know, and sort of that grief in advance of something that may or may not happen. So I think it can show up in different ways, but it's a, I think that's a really important thing to clue into is this idea of anticipatory grief and are we sort of punishing ourselves before we are actually experiencing it? Well, there's an advantage in anticipatory grief. It's the realization that all attachments do come to an end. All bonds do come to an end. So if you use anticipatory grief to do what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross taught, say goodbye before the final goodbye. What does that mean? You sit down with a parent. You sit down with someone who's going to die, a 
or someone who's sick or someone that you're not going to see again after you leave school or whatever it might be. And you say, if this were the last moment I would ever see you, here's what I would want you to know. And you go through the process of saying goodbye. So every moment after that becomes a gift. You see, that's what you have to transfer disciplinary grief in. And I've helped so many couples who face death after 50, 60, 70 years of marriage. And one of the partners is ill and the other is likely to get sick or die within months after how to say goodbye before they actually, one of them does die. And we know grief is a key factor in premature death. And it's also a key factor in people who lose a companion or a spouse after 40 years. 80% are dead or terminally ill within months. Same with retirement. You go through retirement, you don't have a new attachment. You don't have a dream that you want to live. The likelihood of being disabled or sick or dying after retirement is also very, very high. And I really relate to what you're saying about this, the, the sense of anticipatory grief being a gift. My dad passed away at 97 last year after years of dementia. And I saw my mom really go through a lot of anticipatory grief. And I feel like to some extent I was able to, and I love that you're putting words to it because reasonably early on, I was able to really have that moment of goodbye with my father. And so every time that I saw him after that, there was a lightness to it. There was a gift. It was, it a, was gift. a gift. Exactly that. One more yeah. And one more loss. Exactly. And I'm curious and uh, feel like we could talk for hours because this is such an important topic and it really doesn't get nearly enough airtime, if you will. But I'd love to know a little bit more about, just to round out, we've spoken about grief. We've spoken about unresolved grief. I feel like almost there's almost more danger. There's almost more harm caused in unresolved grief. And I'm wondering if you can maybe share with us some of the steps that leaders might be able to take to shed light on unresolved grief or even transform grief into a creative force in our work lives. I think it's the use of questions, asking, inquiry, not interrogation, it's not a prosecution, inquiry, understanding what's going on with the other person and helping them put labels to what they are feeling. And the feelings, primary feelings of grief are going to be anger, sadness, fear, panic. And then the understanding the stages, the acceptance, and being able to go through that, and ultimately the new attachment, the forgiveness, and then coming back to the gratitude. So as a leader, how can I talk to a person about their experience of being disappointed in not getting a job, or in a personal loss, how it is for them to lose a parent or a spouse? In the article, I talk about this man whose daughter was uh, died in his arms. And for all these 25 years, he lost jobs. He became an alcoholic. He was carrying grief until he could say goodbye to his daughter and then restructure in his brain, come back to use the rest of his life to live joy, to inspire his daughter. You see, we don't help anybody. And I learned this from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross with the death of my own son. We don't help them by suffering or being a victim. We use the time we have left to inspire and be inspired. So that the leaders should not say, don't feel what you're feeling. That's a no-no. What is it that you are feeling? How can I be of a help? Sometimes it does require in complex grief situations. Complex grief is where one grief activates or triggers many other griefs and you got a whole network of grief as opposed to a single loss. Maybe that needs, requires professional help, something beyond. But you as a leader can be a secure base in helping people label what they are feeling. That's what hostage negotiators do. They help the hostage taker label what the feeling is over the loss that they're experiencing and how to then identify what they desire if the desire is unrealistic, how to be able to accept another form of desire that is compatible and we get a 95% success rate. Wow, George, the amount of just insight and, you know, at a personal level, just raw experiential 
knowledge that you've brought to this conversation today. I've personally taken so much away from this and I know Sally has too. For leaders, what I'm really hearing as being that key takeaway is to just create the safe space to hold other human beings in whatever their experience is and that this is in fact a deeply organizational practice and a leadership practice, not just one that we should be reserving for the homes and for our friends and for our loved ones. This is a human practice and we can hold this sacred and special and extremely important space for human beings to experience their humanness. And this is what actually gets us through things like unresolved grief. So George, thank you so much. Can I just say one thing there? What we hear from leaders say, well, that's not my job. My job is to get a result. Yes. But the way to get the best result is to engage people, inspire people. So yes, it is your job to be able to deal emotionally intelligently with the pain people are in if you want a great result. It's being able to do that as a step before getting that result. But you're absolutely right. It is so fundamental in organizations to be able to face that grief and to not be a hostage. And for a leader to be able to do that, they have to face their own griefs. They have to be able to be emotionally available to bond, to be empathetic, to be compassionate. And we know the high numbers of leaders who are narcissistic, self-centered. They're not able to be emotionally available. Sorry to add all that little pontificating there at the end. <laughs> Love it. We're here for Very it. <laughs> fantastic, George. George, again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. It's been a delight having this conversation with you. And I'm sure there won't be a single leader listening to this podcast that hasn't taken away incredible amounts of new insight. Thank you. And we're so grateful for the time you've given us. You are very welcome. It's a pleasure. And I hope to visit Australia sometime in the future, not so far away. We'd love that. We'd love that. God bless you. And to all your listeners. Thank you for joining us for this powerful conversation with George Cole Reeser. After we spoke to George, Alexis and I chatted for probably another hour on the insights we'd each gained. There's no escaping grief. It is part of the human experience. By owning our own grief and being present to the grief of those around us, we grow as humans and as leaders. And as George mentions, we cannot grieve alone. If you're experiencing grief, we encourage you to reach out for support. We hope George's experience, kindness and wisdom touches you as much as it did us. You can find links to George's books, articles and work in the show notes. And you can join us and our community of human leaders at www.wearehumanleaders.com. See you next time. Thank you.